All right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming um, to this talk, Curious Perversions in Information Technology. Before I get started, let me give a little bit of background about myself. My name is Alex Papadimoulis, and I'm a programmer. Um, I've been a software developer now for a little bit more than a decade. And, you know, I've worked at a whole lot of different places from, you know, small one-man shops, just me obviously, to, you know, the large soul-sucking corporation. Um, these days I work for my own small consulting company and have a lot of fun doing that. Another thing that I do is I'm the editor of the website thedailywtf.com. Now, if you haven't been to the Daily WTF, its tagline is Curious Perversions in Information Technology. The same tagline or the same title as this presentation. So if you go there, you can see all sorts of, uh, you know, fun perversions in IT. So, you know, a little bit about the site here. Um, it started several years back when I worked at a relatively small consulting company. Um, a large part of my job was maintaining other people's code. And, you know, I don't know how many of you guys are developers, but, you know, I was just astonished at a lot of the really, really bad code that I had to maintain. You know, we're talking some really bad stuff here. Hundreds of lines of code to parse an integer. This, I should note, is in high-level languages like BASIC or, you know, C-sharp. Uh, thousands of lines of code to parse, you know, date time. You don't even want to see the code that they had to do to, you know, turn an integer into hexadecimal. It was, it was crazy. So, you know, just one day, I had enough. I just couldn't take it anymore and did like any other developer in, in my position did and blogged about it. So this, for whatever reason, on this day, this is what really bugged me. I don't know if you, you know, how many of you know databases too well, but what this is, is this is a database table. It was a critical production table that had no rows in it. All it had was a bunch of columns that had the same name as their data type. For whatever reason, it was critical, and it, you know, just really bugged me that day. So I complained about it and posted it. What I found was that it felt good to complain. I really like bitching about work. And the next day, you know, I had something else to complain. So I posted that. You know, the third day, I posted something else. Next thing I know, people were sending me really bad code to post as well. So I started posting that, registered the, oop, registered the daily WTF, and there we go. So that's, uh, you know, it turns out that I was not alone with, uh, with bad code. Now I'm curious about, about you guys. So I was hoping to get a show of hands for how many programmers, developers, code monkeys we have. Cool, cool. Now, how many of you guys work with programmers, developers, code monkeys? You know, so that's just about everyone. I don't think you know, we're going to need a show of hands for this one, but who has <laughs> used software that sucks? All of us. You know, the, the, the question is, is why, but before we get into that, let's take a look at some bad software. This is, uh, these are some screenshots from, uh, from a feature I run on the Daily WTF. Users send in all sorts of weird error messages that, that they get from software. Here's one that somebody came across on Netflix. If you enjoyed Last of the Mohicans, I think you'll enjoy Last of the Mohicans. This is from a bug tracking application internally. It was for, you know, when users complained about their Aramaic version not working. I'm going to say no. Those who have children uh, might find this a little disturbing, you know. <laughs> Retry. That's, that's got to be it. And then we've got one of my favorites here. 872-349-2872-438. Shit, that's not prime. 
So, you know, the, the question is, how do we get messages like this? How the heck do we get software to just spew out these ridiculous error messages? Um, sometimes, you know, it's just the right combination of things that are happening. You know, who knows, there's just that many users on the server. There's just, you know, the right edge case in the algorithm that's not being considered. Usually, though, it's going to be bad code that's behind it. So just to give you an idea, um, here's a bit of like pseudo C-sharp code here um, that, that kind of, you know, is some bad code. Um, you know, what we have here is the developer is doing all sorts of things, you know, with, uh, you know, with an order, you know, um, order ID, adding items to the list. And regardless of what happens anywhere along the way, all we have at the end is, oops, something bad happened. That's worse than useless because how could anybody debug that if, an error, if a user were to get that? You know, there's no idea of how to fix it. And, you know, that's, that's why we see a lot of these error messages that just don't make sense. Like that, oops, child died. Pretty, pretty useless. So the next question then is how the heck do we end up with bad code like this? Obvious. It's the bad developers. Now, I, you know, a lot, those of you who are software developers or work software developers probably know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, a lot of times, these developers have code named after them. The Dave code, the Jed code, uh, the Brian code. And oftentimes, that code lives long after they're gone and out wreaking havoc somewhere else. And, you know, you, you always hear, you know, the other developers just cursing, damn Jed, damn Dave, you know, and that's, you know, that's just um, where a lot of these, you know, where a lot of the code comes from. I, I've worked uh, with, with a lot of bad developers in my day, but one of the worst, actually I'm going to say the worst is, if I can get this, Marcus. Um, Marcus didn't care at all about software. You know, it was his job. He was a programmer, but, you know, it just, it just wasn't his thing. He was in at 9.05, 9.10 every day. He left 4.55 every day. And, you know, it's just he was a really lazy guy. And actually, funny thing, the one time I did see him af in the office after 5, uh, it was like 6.30 or something like that, and I said, Marcus, what the heck are you still doing here? Do you have a deadline or something? That, you know, never worked for Marcus because Marcus never met deadlines as long as, you know, if he couldn't get it done by five, it wasn't getting done. Well, it turns out Marcus was in the room, you know, was, was still there because he was just hanging out to go to WrestleMania later that night. And that was, you know, that was his thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with, with professional wrestling. I... You know, who doesn't love the drama between The Undertaker and the Irish guy? It's, it's a lot of fun, you know. Um, but the thing is, is that's all that Marcus cared about. You know, when he was in the office, he wasn't thinking, gosh, how the hell do I solve this problem with code? He's thinking, gosh, I wonder who's going to win in tonight's, uh, you know, in tonight's whatever the heck they ha uh, call, the, call the events. Um, and by the way, I should note, that's why I feel very safe talking about Marcus here, because this is the last place he would ever come. You know, he, he's not the type to do anything, um, you know, outside the office. So one, what, one thing that I remember about Marcus, and one of the, the few pieces of code that I saved that, that he wrote was code that compared two strings. Uh, now this is, uh, you know, this was in .NET, uh, C Sharp, and I, you know, don't know how many of you guys are, are, you know, C Sharp developers, but comparing two strings in C Sharp is very, very easy. You have string A here, your second string there, equal, equal. The result of that expression is true if the strings compare, false if they don't. So how did Marcus do it? Like that. <laughs> Now, you know, the first time I saw this, I mean, you, you, when you see stuff like this, it's, you know, I was speechless. But let me do a quick walkthrough of, of what this code is all about. First, 
he compares that the two strings are null, you know, if either one of them is null. But he, he really liked this strange ternary operator. Uh, you know, so you can see if they're null, then one. But if one is equal to zero, then they're not equal. It was just his way of doing things. It makes, it's really a roundabout way to, you know, check for equal. Um, so the next thing he did is he converted both. Uh, okay, he checked the length of both strings. Obviously, if they're not equal, the strings aren't equal. Then he converted them to a character array. And again, checked the length just because, you know, who knows, maybe the first time was lying. Then again, he loops over each character, checking for the null terminator, which doesn't really make sense in, you know, in, in C sharp or .NET because that's not how we really end strings. But, you know, that's that's what he did. I think that he got it from, you know, what what I believe happened is how he ended up at code like this is he, you know, he Googled how do you compare two strings came across this. I mean, this looks kind of, sort of, like a bastardization of the strcmp function in C. And it kind of ended up here. So that's, that's, how he ended, um, that's how he ended up with this. So this was just a representative example of the code that he wrote. It was all like this. It was all really, really amazingly bad. I mean, I couldn't even think of writing code like that. I don't know how anybody does. Um, but what, you know, when I went to him and I said, Marcus, why did you write this code? Why? Why? His response, it works the same. Well, it doesn't in all cases, but for what we needed to do, it worked the same. And what he said further is, sure, it works the same. Um, and yeah, I might have wasted 20, 30, 40, two hours writing that function, but now I can reuse it. And that he did. So this, that r equal function was in every single project he wrote. And as were all the other functions that he put in functions.cs. You know, so that was pretty faint, painful. Now, Marcus and, and folks like Marcus are, you know, in the, in the world of professional programmers, um, are really the bottom of the barrel. You know, they're the opposite of the, you know, uh, uh, creme de la creme, which is where this uh, really bad pun came in. Um, you know, they're, they're everywhere, you know, except for here. Again, because, and I'm not just saying that, I mean, really, the people who are in that bottom 5% aren't going to be going and taking their weekends, especially this early on a Saturday, to come in and learn about technology. Um, you, know, these, you know, these bottom of the industry guys are in every single industry from, you know, hair care, finance. There is even the worst pilot. You know, somebody has to be the worst. And he's probably out there flying a plane, hopefully not one that any of you are going to fly back on or anything. What, what astonishes me is how these guys manage to get jobs. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, you know, if you think about it, think of, think of yourself, and this is a little hard to do for, you know, for a lot of reasons, but put yourself in Marcus's shoes. How the hell did he get a programmer job? Well, it's simple. Try, try, try repeat 100 times, try again. Eventually, he's going to get it. Somebody's going to you know, hire him. He's going to learn all the tricks. And you know, for a few years, he'll be in his job. And it'll be you know, a long time before anyone else can, um, you know, can figure out. Now, no matter where you work, you know, even, if you, even if you run your own company, you have to learn to deal with bad programmers, just bad people in the industry. Because how many of us get to choose our own uh, workers and clients? Well, I'm sure you know Drew. He doesn't have any clients to, to worry about, so you're lucky in that aspect. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, I I have my own company, and I have to work. You know, I have to deal with clients who are very similar to the to, to the Marcuses. So, what? You know, what I, what I came up with over the years in working with uh, bad developers is, is some tips and tricks to deal with some of these guys. 
bad developer damage control. The first way to really kind of deal with the bad developers is overhead. You would be surprised how many bad developers hate source control, issue tracking. And when you make them use it, it gives them a chance to use it as an excuse to write less code. Less code is better for everyone. You'd be surprised that <laughs> when you just go in Excel, generate columns and columns of random data, print it out, and then go, Marcus, I'm going to need you to program this in a language called Excel. It's pretty simple. Just type numbers in here, and there, and there, and there. That's going to keep him busy for weeks. Not very useful, but you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good way to get him to pass time. Remember, these guys don't like staying in the office uh, anywhere past the core hours. So schedule code review early in the morning, late at night. They're going to, you know, obviously they're going to have to write code. It's going to have to go in production. But if you schedule code reviews early on, they're going to, again, want to write less code, which is a good thing. And then the last tip is management. I don't mean that so much in, you know, try to get them to be your boss, but give them useless management things to do. Task management. One title that I've always found works well is anything that has the word liaison in it. <laughs> the the one, one place that I worked with, he was a developer. His title was, de, you know, senior developer. Senior because he was there for like 10 years. He was the requirements liaison and did nothing but just talk to business analysts. A, you know, perfectly useless, but it got him writing less code and that was, you know, that was good for us all. So, the bad news, though, is as bad as you know, the Marcuses of the world are, they are not the worst problem with software. They are not the, the, the real reason that software sucks. I mean, think about it. You know, there aren't that many at the bottom of the barrel. And those that are, they don't write that much code. You know, the, the scope of their you know, damage is really limited to the things that they've touched. And Honestly, you know, it's really easy to undo a lot of their damage. The, the, the real reason um, that software sucks is kind of the opposite. It's the really good developers, you know, the guys who are really, really smart. Um, that seems a little counterintuitive, but, you know, there was one guy that I worked with who, well, before I get into that, though, um, there's a really good reason why brilliant developers, you know, cause a lot of problems. The, the first reason is software is really, really boring. Most software, I should say. Most software is the type of software that you use to power mortgage loan application processing or, um, you know, do stuff like commission tracking, time logging. This isn't very exciting stuff. This isn't like the page rank algorithm or some of the stuff that, you know, uh, the, you know hardware um, programming. That sounds fun. That sounds challenging. But for the most part, software is really, really boring. And by their very nature, developers are pretty smart, you know? I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't know how many went through a you know, computer science curriculum, but some of the classes that you have to go through in that, you know, compiler design, you know, calculus, linear algebra, this is not easy stuff, you know, and not anybody can do it. I mean, even Marcus, who, you know, again, bottom of the barrel, is probably a bit smarter than the average guy who hasn't, you know, who hasn't gone through, have that background. So if you take these two facts, number one, software is boring, you know, developers are smart, it combines into a bad, bad thing. When you give a menial task, writing boring software, to highly capable individuals, it, uh, it doesn't end up going well a lot of times. Um, I'm going to bring out a quote from Michael Jackson. Not that Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson uh, was a, you know, is still a writer, um, you know, teacher. He's been doing software for um, longer than most of us have, have been alive. 
And his quote is, programmers often take a refuge in an understandable but disastrous inclination towards complexity and ingenuity in their work. Forbidden to design anything larger than a program, which in 1975, you know, there were programs, modules, things on top of that. Um, so what he means here, you know, given a relatively small task, they will respond by making that program intricate enough to challenge your professional skill. They make things overcomplicated. So, you know, what's interesting is that he observed this in 1975, and in my experience, this exact problem, the really brilliant programmers, the guys who are overcomplicating things, are the biggest reason for all of the major software disasters out there that we've seen. Um, one that, that I uh, had the um, fortune of being a large part in was, was with a fellow um, several years back named Brandon. Brandon was an incredibly smart guy. Uh, I'm not kidding. He had, you know, several degrees from pretty good universities. He wrote, I want to say, seven books. Um, you know, he had every certification I've ever heard of. And, you know, not only that, he worked in every single industry out there. Healthcare, finance, manufacturing. Um, you know, and that was really, you know, he was a really, really smart guy. Um, so you'd think that he'd be a great guy to work with on the team. Well, the, you know, what had happened is the project that we worked on, um, you know, it was a pretty big and boring project. Uh, it, was, it was used by a larger company to really run an entire floor of, of people. And, um, you know, it was a really highly regulated industry, and to really even read the requirements, you practically had to have a law degree. You know, the system did nothing but, you know, push paper, scan paper, you know, in and out, incredibly, incredibly boring, um, boring stuff. Um, so how we divided up the team, well, not we, how they did, was Brandon, his, he was the team lead for several database developers, you know, and my team, uh, which was the front end, we kind of worked together with them to build this wonderful system for, you know, the hundreds of users um, in there. Now, the system was designed to, you know, uh, this, was, this was a Microsoft shop, you know, uh, all of their infrastructure was Microsoft technology, so the logical choice at the time for the front end was ASP.NET. You know, that's, that's what all the front end developers were good with, and you know, that's what we had the infrastructure for. The back end, obviously, SQL Server. What else do you have in a Microsoft shop? You know, they had the infrastructure again for that, so that's what we chose to, to run this. So then, what did, uh, what, what did they choose for the middle tier? DBase. <laughs> Seriously. Now, I, you know, if you don't know what DBase is, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a older kind of technology. Oh, not, not really that older. It was, you know, from the 90s, and it was, it was a new concept of development for kind of rapid application development. Um, it stored all of its database tables as files. It had its own programming language. It was really integrated. Some related products are DBase, you know, obviously DBase. Um, Clipper is a, is a related product. Fox Pro. Um, I would say it's a lot more complicated version of Microsoft Access, whereas Microsoft Access is, t you know, for users, end users to build applications really fast. DBase is for developers to build, you know, applications really fast. Um, you know, this makes absolutely no sense. ASP.NET.NET is built to communicate with SQL. So, you know, it, 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 I objected, as did everybody else, but um, not Brandon, you know. Brandon had a lot of reasons for why DBase was the perfect, um, you know, was the perfect solution for the middle tier. It was incredibly fast. That's, that's what he said, at least. Um, in fact, these are just mostly his arguments, and I, to this day, they make no sense to me. Um, it had unparalleled string manipulation. Um, 
What else? It could process raw SQL Server data very well, which again doesn't make much sense um, since ASP.NET. .NET can do that very well. Um, probably though the big reason for it was Brandon was one of the world's foremost experts on DBase. Four of the books he had written was on DBase. And um, you know, if you think about it, the .NET guy versus Mr. Two University Degrees, several books written him, he won out. Um, but actually there, there was a real reason that, that he wanted to use DBase. It was for a product that he had been working on for years and years and years that he called XPD Base. Uh, XP, I think, stood for expandable, but none of us ever really knew. Um, what it was, it was, it was actually a framework built on top of, um, you know, on, on top of DBase. And his big argument for this was, he had been doing this for 10 years, you know, he had built this framework up over 10 years, and, you know, it has a proven, proven track record. Um, and obviously, he built it. You know, he has a lot of good credentials. So it was the way to go. Um, the main selling point for DBase, really, was its simplicity. You know, this application, with all the complex requirements, you know, obviously, the front-end developers couldn't possibly grasp that. So, you know, the XP DBase framework was there to simplify our life. Um, you know, it would turn complex applications into, you know, really, really simple tasks. The way that it did this was with something that he called entities. Um, and what an entity was, was it really was just a DBase function that had, uh, I'm sorry, a DBase class that had two functions, um, git and save. And all entities were dynamically coded or I'm sorry, dynamically compiled. And you know, we'll, we'll cover that in a, a second here. Um, with, of course, the exception of the entity entity, which managed all of the other entities. This is already starting to sound like a fun system, I can tell. Um, the other main thing that you know, XPD base did is it could connect to any type of data source imaginable. In theory, of course. Um, Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, um, another DBase product. We only needed SQL Server, but it was there, and that was important to, to, to Brandon. It was also really, really good with security. You see, one of the things is every time you called one of those two methods on an entity, you had to pass in a user ID. So it had this very complicated permissions security mapping system to make sure that the user ID was allowed to call that entity. Um, it was all very elegant, as Brandon said. So as I mentioned before, there are really two methods on the XP DBase entity, uh, or entities. The first we have is called the git, right? And how, you know, what, what a git would do is if you call you know, the XPDB framework, the first thing that you pass in is the entity name. There were, I think, maybe 150 or so different entities, um, all with as useful names as loan app. Um, then you have a filter string, and the thing about filter strings is that it was really important that you had the spacing perfect if you wanted to filter by, let's say, application status, and you know the person who filled out the application, they had to be in the exact order. Um, otherwise, the, the system would respond with really, really odd output. And everything that the XPD base did is it returned XML. The XML was just um, it was generic XML of a data set, so, or of, of a series of, of rows in a table. So we converted the XML into what you would pretty much get if you called a select statement from a database. Uh, then, of course, we have the save. And as you can tell from this, the save was not pretty at all. The, you know, it, it in theory worked the same way. Okay, so you have the loan app as the first parameter, the user ID as the second parameter, but then you had the concept of the save string. I'm sure, you know, if any of you have ever written an update statement, this is so much simpler. Um, you know, the first thing you pass in, it, it is a asterisk tilde delimited string that ends with pseudo somewhat kind of HTML. Um, 
you know, in this case, you know, loan app, that's the underlying SQL Server table. So you would pass in, you know, your parameters or rows kind of as, you know, asterisk tilde attribute value pairs. Um, one of the big things that he said was so great about his system was that you could, by putting many records in it, you could do multiple updates with one single statement. Um, now, it didn't work on all entities, and when it did work, it you know, crashed a lot. So we never actually did it, but in theory, you could do it. Um, but what's cool is that's not all that uh, XPD base was all about. The main thing about it is dynamicness. You know, if you think about it, compiling software is a huge pain in the ass. You have to go to the build menu and then click compile, wait four seconds, and then take your DLL and use it. Well, Brandon's um, XPD base, everything was dynamic. Um, and used dynamic classes in DBase. So how did he do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Um, step-by-step -step kind of process here is all of, his, all of these entity classes were in a table called entities. And what this table was, it had entity name and then a memo column that had all of the class code in it. So that's how, you, that's how these entities or classes were coded. Um, he would take the code out of that database table, save it as a temp file on disk, and then compile the class. Into, into memory, and from there, call the git or save method that you know, we originally requested. Um, and of course, you know, on top of all that, there was you know, the security, the connection management that the XPD-based framework all handled. But what's even cooler is that not only was XPD-based dynamic, it was doubly dynamic. Not only were the entities dynamic themselves, but the dynamic entities could be even more dynamic, and there's a good reason for this. Uh, if you think about it, okay, when you write code that, that's, you know, database code or, or interacts with the database, what are you doing? You're selecting from a table, returning a result set, updating, inserting. It's all very much the same code that, you know, pretty much is pretty generic. So Brandon's solution was this. Um, instead of using a select query on most of his entities, these are all, these all represent D-based tables. Um, there's seven of them total. This is just kind of, I, I summed it up, but it got a lot more complex to build a select statement. Um, you know, for a select statement, you had selection tables. So if you wanted to select seven columns, seven rows went into the selection table. Where your from would normally go, you put that in the source table. And it all kind of, it, it turned a database query, you know, a simple select query into a whole relational, um, into a whole relational thing. He even managed to do it for updates and insert statements, which um, I was never actually able to understand. But I did have a diagram of it. And, you know, I didn't really, you know, maybe now that we have a screen this big, it would have fit. But on my laptop, there were, I think, at least 50 tables that he had to use to build those. So I didn't show those. Um, you know, so with all this really easy to develop stuff, how do you think all of it turned out in the end after nearly a year of, of I think, 12 full-time developers working on it, you know, and building this system? Um, well, not so good on launch day, as it turned out. Um, actually, within hours of the system, uh, starting up, you know, and, and turning on to, to give out to the users. The entire system ground to a complete halt. Uh, nobody could access anything. Every single page locked up. Um, it turned out that it was a bug in Brandon's dynamic inserts. For whatever reason, he was opening transactions but never closing them. Um, it took him a while to debug that and figure that out, but in the meantime, you know, for which was for two really intense days, it was actually a DBA's full-time job to go into SQL Server, refresh on the you know, open processes screen, look at the ones that had been open for more than a few seconds, and right-click and kill them. That's all he did all day, was just click in the database, kill process. Um, but it worked, but you know, obviously that meant like two users out of 300 or so could use it. Um, but you know, after a few days, they were finally able to get it back up and running. So after the first week, um, 
they realized that this system that, that everyone had built was incredibly, incredibly slow. Uh, we're talking, you know, almost a minute for a page to load. Um, you know, just a page that listed some data out of the database, which would take microseconds, you know, had we just gone to the database directly, of course. Um, so what Brandon said was, obviously, our quad Xeon computers, or whatever the heck we had, they were about $10,000 a piece for the database and web server. They weren't powerful enough to power that many users. So they bought four more servers uh, to bring it up to a total of six. Uh, three for the database, three for the front end. Um, and actually, that made things a little bit better. Page times went from 30 seconds to three seconds. Um, you know, so it was an improvement. Now, the problem was, though, about a couple months later, the system started just progressively getting slower. Uh, one of the things Brandon didn't really believe in either was database indexes. And, you know, when you have a lot of data in there, and he's, oh, he also didn't really like where clauses a lot. So he was pulling entire table sets, filtering them in dbase. Um, so what that ended up happening is we went back to, it actually got worse than what the week one was. There was, and, and what did uh, Brandon say at this point? Well, nothing, because he, uh, you know, went on to do bigger and better things, um, scarily enough, after calling this a success. Um, so there was really absolutely nothing we could do other than try to just patch it with, uh, with duct tape over the next few months. Um, and in the end, after nine months, over well over a million dollars of development cost, they scrapped the whole system because it was totally, totally unusable. Um, you know, so the thing is, is this is not an uncommon story. You know, if, if you've ever heard of these giant disasters in IT, you know, like the FBI's virtual case file. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, too familiar, but that was, you know, a hundred and, I want to say, $70 million train wreck of a, um, you know, of a problem. All because, you know, and, and of course, the reports and postmortems don't give the technical details, but... A lot of times it ends up happening just like this. After a few months of use, the system is totally, totally unusable. Um, you know, the question then is, with Brandon being such a smart guy, how the heck did such a, a horrible, horrible system get built? You know, obviously, XPD Base had been in his mind for years and years and years. You know. Every project before this big one, he had been, you know, using some bastardization of XPD base, some smaller version of it to, to power it. And, you know, as the projects went on, as he evolved this, this solution, um, he would figure out more, you know, uh, he would identify more problems. And then to fix those problems, he'd add even more problems on until he just ended up with XPD base. Um, this project was one of the biggest that he had worked on um, with XPD Base, and it provided him and his six developers the opportunity to put all of the, you know, his, his brilliant idea in, into play. Um, you know, practicality be damned was really his, you know, his way of thinking. You know, he tricked himself into thinking that all of the development hours that he focused and all of the, the time that, that everyone put was really for the better good of the system. Um, you know, and, and all along the ways, you know, he'd throw aside requirements and say, no, no, we got to focus on this feature of XPD base. And he was really on the quest to create the perfect dynamic solution that he, nobody would ever have to write code for, but somehow, would solve all of the, you know, requirements. Um, you know, the real problem was that he was always, you know, looking the wrong way. He never saw this as a chance to build this really boring information system that did nothing but push paper between several hundred different people. He saw it as the, the perfect, you know, solution to, to the perfect opportunity to build this really complex um, beast. In the end, Brandon was too clever for his own good. You know, I uh, hate to use the pun there, but that this is a, a perfect example of that. 
So, you know, one of the takeaways from this is, you know, this can happen to all of us. You know, um, any one of us can be caught up in our own cleverness. You know, looking back at some of the things that I did, uh, it's, it's actually really embarrassing just thinking of how I thought this could have been a good idea to, you know, to do. Um, obviously, I didn't build anything like XPD base, but, you know, maybe if I had enough, you know, delusion and, and you know, worked at it long enough, maybe I would have built it. I don't know. Um, you know, but like dealing with bad developers, this is, this is something that, you know, we really need to be careful of, um, you know, when we're building, you know, when we're building systems. Um, avoiding being too clever is almost as, you know, is, is can be certainly pretty easy. Um, the first tip that, that I have to kind of help avoid this is, you know, the G.I.G., the G.I. Joe rule knowing is half the battle. Really, now that everyone here has learned about XPD base, I don't think any of you guys are ever going to build it for your clients or for, you know, anything like that. It's it's just not going to, you know, it's it's not going to happen. The second one is of course the buddy system. You know, after, you know, after you build, you know, your your initial specs, after you think it all out, show it to a friend. You know, show it to your co to your coworkers, to it, show it to your colleagues. Chances are they're not as insane as you, and they're they they aren't caught up in the requirements as much, and they can give you a clean perspective. Um, you know, just last year, I really no no joking was made a UI abstraction layer in the event that this product that that uh, we were building might have a, a web and a uh, Windows interface. And for, at the time, it seemed like the greatest idea because this way we can code the UI and not have to worry about how Windows and, and the web acts. And as soon as I showed it to somebody, uh, he had you know, really three words to say uh, that can be summed up with WTF. <laughs> um, you know, the, the problem with the buddy system, though, is that it can kind of get into what's called groupthink. The demotivational poster, I think, sums up groupthink the best. Uh, none of us is as dumb as all of us. Um, you know, obviously Andy, or I'm sorry, not Andy, Brandon wasn't the only one who thought uh, XPD base was a great idea. His entire team did. You know, six relatively, you know, intelligent people led by a really, really smart guy all believed that what they were building was a great system. And, you know, similarly, it's easy to get your team caught up in, you know, um, really, really bad things as well. Um, so that's something to, to be careful about. The, probably the best way, and this is certainly something that I'm sure just about everyone here has learned as well, is put your cleverness in a hobby. You know, some of the, some of, you know, take demos, for example. You know, that is some of the most clever things I have ever seen. I, I have no idea how, you know, these incredible things can be compacted into 4K of code. That, you know, to me is, takes some incredibly clever things. That cleverness belongs in, you know, in, in fun stuff, you know, like, uh, like demos, like hacking. Um, it's not something that you want to deliver to a client who just wants to have a system that they can enter data in, get it out, and print it out. We don't need that really complex stuff for that. And, you know, the final, the final kind of tip that I'm going to leave with is something... That, that it's just one simple word called gloves. Um, now, gloves probably doesn't make any sense unless you've heard, you know, the accompanying story. Um, now, at, you know, and, and this is something that one of the readers of WTF sent in a, a while back. Um, he worked at a large consulting company that did, you know, they were one of the big ones. There were thousands of developers through it, and they were consequently one of the consulting companies that is 
quite often behind the 10, you know, $100 million disasters. Um, and, you know, one day, some, some folks out of their New England office posted on their off-topic internal discussion board that on his bike ride to work, he noticed that the brisk morning kept his hands pretty damn cold. And he, he looked online and was very surprised that no one had invented a hand warming system for, his, for the bike. So he could put his hands on the handlebars and it would warm it, kind of <laughs> like a heated steering wheel for a car, perhaps. Um, so when he first posted that, that started a whole torrent of discussion. Um, somebody immediately replied, well, gee, you know what we could do? We could attach a dynamo to the, uh, you know, to, the, to the wheel and then use that to generate heat for your hands. You know, that would work. Then they went about and how, well, that might cause too much. You know, you'll, you'll lose torque, you'll lose power. So, um, you know, several hours and, uh, you know, I'm sure hundreds of hours of, of you know, build client time later, uh, they came up with the ultimate solution, which I wish I had a, a, a diagram of it, but it involved a thin outer jacket that had several veins of water through it, inlet and outlet valves, a battery backup powered dynamo that used compression valves to reuse body heat and if it didn't get hot enough, uh, you know, if you, if you weren't warm enough, then you know, it would use the dynamo to run over the handlebars and also something over your hands. And you know, um, at the end, and I think this was sometime after launch, after all these, you know, uh, uh, huge discussion, somebody just posted um, and said that there's a really good reason that this system hasn't been invented. Um, because there's already a pretty suitable way to warm your hands. It's called gloves. That pretty much ended the discussion there. <laughs> Nobody really thought, wow, we can lose, you know, we can use gloves. So, you know, leaving on that, I'll say take a good hard look at your first submission and just say to yourself, gloves. Um, so that's, that's really all I had for, you know, for the presentation. I'm not sure how, you know, how we're doing on time. Um, but any, any sort of questions or comments? How are we on time? Is anybody? Uh, we've got like three or four minutes, maybe. Okay. Um, well, that was, uh, that's it that I had. And if there's no other questions, you know, if there's no questions or anything, um, I guess that's it. So, thank you.